afternoon and welcome to NEETEC's COVID-19 webinar series, Ebola and the Age of COVID. My name is Trish Tennell. I'm Associate Director of Nursing for Health and Hospitals Bellevue, New York City. I'm also their nurse lead for their Special Pathogens Unit and an SME for NEETEC. Today we'll have Dr. Bruce Weber, Webner, Dr. Anna Yaffe, and Kate Bolter from Nebraska. You may have known us as the National Ebola Training and Education Center. We are now the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center, but we've always had the same mission statement, to increase the capability of the United States public health and healthcare systems to safely and effectively manage individuals with suspected and confirmed special pathogens. There are four arms to the tech, assessment, education, technical assistance, and our research network. All of these arms talk to each other. And even though in this day we may be going virtual, we can help you with any needs that you may have. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Bruce Ribner from Emory. Thank you, Trish, and welcome to you, those of you who are out in the audience. I'm Bruce Ribner, uh, Professor of Infectious Disease at Emory University Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia, and a Principal Investigator of the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center, and Medical Director of the Serious Communicable Diseases Unit at Emory University Hospital. Ebola. Many of you thought probably it had kind of disappeared in 2016 when we controlled the outbreak in West Africa. But as you can see on this slide, that's far from the truth. For the last five years, ever since 2016, Ebola has remained a smoldering problem in Africa, primarily in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And there's been at least one outbreak each year since that time. One of them in 2018 to 2020, infecting over 3,000 individuals and killing over 2,000. We look at where things are today. Not surprisingly, there is an ongoing outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo as we speak. It is in North Kivu province, which is where the 2018-2020 outbreak occurred. Exact numbers are very difficult to obtain, but we estimate somewhere about 12 to 15 cases and around five to 10 fatalities. The number of cases, as you see on this graphic, we believe is still small. And unlike 2014 to 2016, we now have a very robust vaccination program going on with ring vaccination to try and contain the cases in the DRC. And to date, over 800 individuals have been vaccinated uh, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Next slide will show us the geographic location of the outbreak. And the thing to bear in mind is that, uh, as you can see from this, uh, it, borders the border, it borders the countries of Rwanda and Uganda. And so there is active surveillance on those borders uh, because frequently in a porous border like that, individuals try to uh, go through without reporting fevers and other symptoms that would be of concern to us. On the next slide, we have the situation in Guinea. And again, this may be familiar to many of you because Guinea is indeed the country where the 2014 to 2016 outbreak of Ebola virus disease started. Again, numbers are tough to come across, roughly 15 to 20 individuals infected and roughly 10 fatalities. Once again, the good news is that there is a rigorous um, vaccine campaign going on in Guinea as we speak, and over a thousand individuals have been vaccinated so far today. On the next slide, we give you a little more feel for the location. Again, similar to the uh, geographic location which, uh, in which the outbreak occurred in 2014 to 2016, this area borders the Ivory Coast and uh, Liberia. And so there is grave concern for the potential for transmission to individuals in those countries as well. 
Many of you may have read approximately a week ago, a rather interesting development in the Guinea outbreak. In that outbreak, a 51 year old nurse who had originally been diagnosed with typhoid and malaria died in late January. Several people who attended her funeral fell ill, including members of her family and a faith healer. Four of them died. At this point, local health authorities began to suspect that this was not typhoid and malaria. And so they uh, tested the nurse's husband and indeed found that he had Ebola virus disease. And so on February 13th, an outbreak of Ebola virus disease was declared in Guinea with the nurse, the likely index case. But the thing that really grabbed our attention was a few weeks, a few weeks later, when genomic analysis revealed that the virus obtained from the nurse's husband looked very similar to the virus which had circulated in Guinea during the 2014 to 2016 outbreak. Suggesting that rather than being a new introduction from the wildlife reservoir, this in fact had been virus which had been dormant in a survivor since 2014 to 2016. And it's hypothesized that the virus reactivated in the survivor to probably laying dormant in an immunologically protected site. And just to remind you, the major immunologic protected sites for Ebola are the testes in the male, the eye, and the central nervous system. And so this, of course, has raised a great deal of concern in the infection prevention community, as well as the infectious disease community, because it may have important implications for managing other survivors as they uh, come into the healthcare system. And certainly, if a uh, survivor needs surgery or another invasive procedure that involves either the urinary tract, the eye, or the central nervous system, this should be a, uh, a decision which is carefully approached with both infectious disease, infection control, and whatever surgical subspecialty is managing. As a uh, result of these two outbreaks going on now in uh, Guinea and the Democratic Republic of Congo, on March 1st, the CDC uh, decided that all air travelers arriving in the United States from either the DRC or Guinea would be channeled into six airports in the United States. Again, very similar to what we did during the West African outbreak. And these airports are similar to the ones we had before, Kennedy, Dulles, O'Hare, Hartsfield, Jackson, LA, and Newark. And the next slide, we look at what individuals coming back from the DRC or from, the, uh, from Guinea, how they will be evaluated by Customs and Border Patrol. So all individuals coming back will be screened. They will be asked whether or not they were transiting through an airport or actually in an Ebola outbreak area. A risk assessment will be done to determine whether they were a caregiver, a healthcare provider, a laboratory worker or a burial worker in the outbreak area. They will be questioned as to whether they used appropriate personal protective equipment and other recommended infection control measures during any potential exposure. And then finally, they'll be evaluated for any high risk exposures such as percutaneous mucous membrane or skin contact with blood and body fluids direct contact with an individual known or suspected to have Ebola virus disease, whether they provided healthcare to a patient with known or suspected Ebola virus disease, either without the use of recommended personal protective equipment or experiencing a breach in infection control procedures when they were caring for such a patient. And finally, whether they had direct contact with or the occurrence of a breach in infection control precautions while handling a dead body who may have died from Ebola virus disease. On the next slide, we have the algorithm that will be used once this risk assessment has been done. So starting on the left side, if it's someone who has experienced a high risk exposure, as I just went over on the last slide, they will have the initial risk assessment. 
They will have health education as to uh, what to look out for. They will have daily symptom monitoring by the health authorities in the geographic location where they have landed. They will be put in mandatory quarantine for 21 days while they're being daily monitored by the health authorities. And then finally, uh, travel out of the area will be uh, expressly prohibited, especially on any common carrier. Now, if they were present in the outbreak area, but they don't meet the criteria for a high-risk high exposure, once again, they will have a risk assessment in health education. They will again have symptom monitoring, but now, and interestingly enough, the phraseology is midway through the 21-day period, rather than saying on day 10 or 11, but that's the guideline. And then again, monitored on the end of uh, the end of the 21-day period uh, for symptoms and signs of Ebola virus disease. They will not have any movement restrictions within the location where they have landed, but they will only be permitted to travel with the prior notification and authorization of the health department where they are currently housed and to the health department where they are proposing to travel to. Now, if the individual was present in the outbreak country, but not in an outbreak area, once again, there will be a risk assessment in health education. They will have an optional evaluation for signs and symptoms of 21 days, but not a required one. And unlike in the prior two scenarios, there will be no movement restriction and no restrictions on uh, travel to other parts of the United States. Looking at management of patients who are infected with the Ebola virus, we have some marked improvements, but some old standbys. We knew back in 2014 to 2016 that the reason why patients coming back to West Africa, sorry, West Europe and the United States had such a better outcome and patients being treated in country was because of the resource rich environment in which we were able to deliver supportive care. And that remains the basis of our management today. So all supportive care consists of providing fluids and electrolytes, using medication to support blood pressure, reduce vomiting and diarrhea, and manage pain and fever, and also treating another infection if it occurs. Now, again, 2014 to 16 was just the beginning of the explosion in molecular diagnostics in especially microbiology. And most of you are probably quite aware of all the developments which have occurred over the last five years. So whereas in 2014 and 2016, all algorithms talking about other infectious diseases occurring in the same patient were basically uh, centered on empiric treatment. Nowadays, courtesy of all the molecular testing that we can do, which is safe to do on patients with Ebola, Ebola virus disease, we are now much better able to manage any additional infections that they may experience while they are uh, infected with the Ebola virus. However, we have had some dramatic breakthroughs in medical countermeasures in managing patients with Ebola virus disease. You may all remember back in 2014 and 15, we thought ZMAP or favipiravir or remdesivir were dramatic beneficial drugs for the patients infected with Ebola virus disease. But courtesy of some very excellent randomized studies which have been done over the last five years, including the POM study, we now know that all of these agents offered negligible benefit to our patients, which is why, again, I say that because we had such a great survival rate in Western Europe and the United States, it was clearly supportive care which made the difference. We do, however, now have two monoclonal antibody preparations, Imnizib and Evanga, which were approved by the FDA last year. And in randomized double-blind studies, these agents dramatically improved survival in patients infected with the Ebola virus. The other change, as I alluded to in my situation report on Guinea and the Democratic Republic of Congo, 
is we now have an FDA approved vaccine. The FDA approved the Ebola virus vaccine, Evibo, in December of 2019. Its major use during the West African outbreak was in Guinea during the 2014 to 2016 outbreak. And during that ring vaccination trial, the vaccine was calculated to be 100% effective, really dramatic. Now the vaccine is a live attenuated recombinant vesicular stomatitis virus. It's a single intramuscular vaccination, but unfortunately, much like some of the coronavirus vaccines that we're dealing with today, it must be stored at extreme ultra cold, which of course makes it a challenge in resource limited countries. Because of the availability of this FDA approved agent uh, vaccine, and because of the ongoing activity in Guinea and the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices of the CDC recommended that pre-vaccination, pre-exposure vaccination with Avibo be given to adults greater than 18 years of age in the US who are at the highest risk for potential occupational exposure to Ebola virus disease. And this is three major scenarios which are envisioned. Number one, if an individual is going to an outbreak area such as Guinea or the DRC. Number two, if they are working at one of the 10 federally designated regional treatment centers in the United States. Or number three, if they're working in a laboratory which is at a biosafety level four level and likely to handle specimens for patients who are infected with the Ebola virus. Now, as I've mentioned before, this is a live virus. It's an attenuated vesicular stomatitis virus, which has been modified to generate antibodies against the Ebola virus. Roughly 70% of the individuals will have pain, swelling, or redness at the injection site. In addition, we see headache, fever, muscle pain, fatigue, joint pain, nausea, arthritis, rash, and abnormal sweating. Even though it's only 5% of the side effects, arthralgia and arthritis have been of special interest with this vaccine. Arthralgia begins about one to two days after vaccination and usually resolves after about a week. Arthritis begins about a week after vaccination and resolves within a few days to weeks. There have been very rare case reports of arthritis and arthralgia persisting longer than this period of time. Now, interestingly enough, of the 15,399 individuals who had received the vaccine in clinical trials, only three had serious adverse reactions and all three resolved without any sequelae. In addition, an, uh, an extra 1,720 individuals uh, were also reported in additional trials and they similarly had zero serious adverse events. So, even though there are some uh, minor side effects associated with the vaccine, serious adverse effects are very, very uncommon. As I've said, it's a live attenuated, attenuated virus. And in vaccines, the virus RNA has been detected in the blood, saliva, urine, and other bodily secretions of vaccines. And so in an abundance of caution, as we like to say, the following precautions have been recommended to vaccinees. Vaccinees should not donate blood for at least six weeks after vaccination. They should avoid sharing needles, razors, utensils, drinking cups, et cetera, for at least two weeks after vaccination. Out of an abundance of caution, vaccinees should use effective barrier prophylaxis methods during any sexual interaction for two months after vaccination. Now this one is a little confusing to people. So avoid close association with an exposure of high risk persons to the blood and body fluids for up to six weeks for the vaccine. This does not refer to healthcare workers working with appropriate infection control practices. This is mainly um, in reference to households where high-risk individuals such as immune-compromised persons, 
pregnant or breastfeeding women and children aged one might be uh, less than one might be present in the household. This is the uh, kind of avoidance that the CDC targets, not healthcare workers working with appropriate infection control practices. Um, I guess this applies to some people. Avoid exposing livestock to the blood and body fluids for at least six weeks after vaccination. And then finally, because the virus may cause a rash and the rash may have viable virus in it, it's recommended that if a vaccinee receives, sorry, develops a rash after the vaccination, the rash be covered until the rash is completely resolved. So as I've told you, there are currently active vaccination programs going on in Guinea and Democratic Republic of Congo. As a matter of fact, all of the FDA approved vaccine is currently in those two countries or in African stockpiles. <clears throat> So if we're going to say that high-risk individuals in the US, either because they're going over to an outbreak area or because they work in a, a uh, regional treatment center should be vaccinated, how do we accomplish that? So it turns out that the manufacturer Merck still has supplies of the virus vaccine that was developed for the clinical trials. But once they have developed the FDA approval, they went to a different manufacturing uh, facility where they are producing the FDA approved vaccine, which is now being shipped overseas. So the FDA worked with the Centers for Disease Control, which carries an IRB, uh, an IND, and an IRB approval. And what was decided that the uh, vaccine, which had currently been manufactured for investigational trials, but was no longer needed for trials, would be made available in the United States to the high-risk groups that I've identified. Because it was made in a different facility, even though it was made with exactly the same process, the decision was made that even though the vaccine is FDA approved, that this particular product had to be administered under an expanded access investigational new drug protocol. So, if an individual is desirous of being vaccinated, <clears throat> excuse me, and they meet the criteria that I went over with you, they need to contact the CDC pharmacy and go through the mechanism for obtaining vaccine for their healthcare workers or laboratories. Now, Annie Yaffe, also of Emory University, will go over Ebola, identify, isolate, and inform. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ribner. Um, as mentioned, my name is Anna Yaffe, and I'm an emergency physician at Emory University in Atlanta. Today, I will be speaking about how we on the front lines can best prepare for a patient presenting with Ebola or another viral hemorrhagic fever. As a frontline provider myself, I know firsthand how exhausted we all have become over the past year in thinking about how to keep ourselves, our staff, and our patients safe from infectious disease while still providing high quality care. Now is the time to be especially vigilant as we reach our new normal and to remember that there are threats beyond COVID-19. If we follow this algorithmic approach of identify, isolate, and inform, we can keep ourselves and our patients safe and continue to provide the best care possible. Next slide. The first step in identifying a potential Ebola person under investigation or PUI is to understand how to recognize these patients. We do this through the case definition. This is a set of uniform criteria that defines the disease and includes both clinical criteria like signs and symptoms, as well as epidemiological risk factors, including travel within the known incubation period and specific exposures like work in a healthcare facility. For example, take these patients presenting to care with similar symptoms. They both appear ill, diaphoretic, maybe malaised. For the patient on the left, the key piece of epidemiological history is travel in the United States last week which makes us more suspicious for a pathogen circulating in the US, maybe COVID-19, versus the patient on the right who traveled to the DRC and even with similar symptoms may be at risk for Ebola. For Ebola virus disease, a PUI is a person who has been both consistent, has both consistent signs or symptoms plus risk factors. The signs and symptoms include fever, fatigue, muscle pain, abdominal pain, 
vomiting, hemorrhage, diarrhea, and headache. The epidemiological risk factors for Ebola should have occurred within the 21 days prior to onset of symptoms and include contact with blood or bodily fluids from a person who is sick or died from Ebola virus disease or contact with objects contaminated with those bodily fluids, contact with infected animals, contact with semen from a man who has recovered from Ebola virus disease, or travel to the geographical area where Ebola virus disease is known to be present and or healthcare, laboratory, or burial work in that area. Facilities should use the case definition in their screening of all patients who enter the facility. Screening should be done immediately upon patient arrival to recognize a PUI and reduce potential transmission in the facility. Remember, early recognition is the key to preventing transmission. Screening can begin earlier when, than when a patient arrives at the front desk. For example, signage at entry enables patients to self-identify. This type of signage should be prominently positioned in multiple languages and with pictograms. Front desk staff should be observant and make sure any patients who appear sick are masked. Electronic or manual screening will then take place at the front desk to ascertain a symptom and travel screen during triage. A systematic approach is important and should include next action steps with guidance should questions trigger a positive response. Remember, a PUI may present at many points of entry at your facility, including at the ED, clinic, or ambulatory care center. They may also present via ambulance and may not yet be identified as a PUI. Some PUIs may present in critical condition. It is important to consider how and where a PUI may, PUI may present and be sure that signage and screening occurs at all points of entry. Additionally, the route a patient takes into your facility and into care is important and consider who will come into contact with the patient on arrival, how you will acutely manage and contain wet symptoms like vomiting and diarrhea, or care for special needs, for example, language translation. There are lots of things to consider, but it all begins by having a plan and trained staff who can critically solve issues as they arise. Once you've identified a PUI, the next step is isolation. This generally will be isolating the patient in a pre-designated room. It is important to know where your isolation room is and the steps necessary to clear the area and to prepare it for your patient. You may need to utilize a transition area to hold a patient before transport to the patient care room. This could be a small room off to the side or a designated area in your waiting room away from other people. And it's important to review the physical infrastructure plan and train your route ahead of time such as how you can secure your route, what rooms might be passed during transport, how the route will be decontaminated following transport, and if how the patient themselves will be transported on the route. The isolation room should be able to be prepared quickly to minimize content in the room. We have learned to minimize the materials in a room during COVID-19, so this should be a familiar process to you. In advance, you can make a list of what goes and what stays to enable anyone to be able to repair the room. Another thing to consider is maintaining a log sheet of who enters the room or is in the immediate area for post-care monitoring. A checklist can be a helpful tool for room preparation. The critical actions prior to patient movement are to have your PPE cart ready in front of the room, remove all extra equipment from the room, and to be sure that hand hygiene stations are operational. The additional steps such as commodes, waste bins, isolation signs, and log sheets can occur after the patient is moved to the room. As you ready your isolation room, carefully consider the route you will take to get the patient to the room. Sometimes the shortest route is not the best route. For example, consider the use of busy hallways, how crowded they might be at that time, and the type of flooring surface for ease of sanitization following transport. You want to choose a route that limits exposure to other people and can also be secured. You also want to consider the PPE you will wear for transport and the containment wrap for the patient if they're having wet symptoms in order to limit exposure. Finally, consider spill cleanup and have a protocol in place should a spill occur in route. Infection control precautions and PPE also assist with isolation of our patients. Recall that a pathogen can have more than one mode of transmission and infection control measures are based on these modes of transmission, 
For Ebola, a minimum of standard contact and droplet isolation should be used for these patients, including signage, appropriate room, and appropriate PPE used. Regardless of the pathogen, remember it is important to know the pathogen transmission and to wear appropriate PPE that will protect you for this mode of transmission. My colleague will be discussing PPE in depth later, but I just wanted to bring to your attention to the fact that our PPE use is a form of isolation as well. Staff should be confident in the PPE they are wearing and the donning and doffing process. I know that we've all become comfortable with some types of PPE during the COVID-19 pandemic, but recall that PPE for Ebola is slightly different, including a minimum of fluid resistant gowns and double gloves with one with an extended cuff. Many of us do not don or doff our COVID-19 PPE with a buddy, but it is important to do this for an Ebola PUI. A donning and doffing buddy can help walk us through less familiar PPE and also inspect our PPE for contamination or compromise. Just-in-time training for wet and dry PPE should be accessible if possible to prepare staff in real time. The last step of the algorithm is to inform. Communication is critical, and in fact, in every exercise or real-life event, communication failures are always at the top of the list of lessons learned. Much attention should be given around communication as it ties all the pieces together. We learned a lot about communication during COVID-19, particularly the importance of establishing relationships and protocols before an event happens. People are more willing to help you if they know you, and this also gives you a chance to get to know someone if someone changes roles. You want to contact a healthcare position rather than an individual person since people um, tend to transition jobs. You should make sure in advance that your contact numbers are correct and have a backup plan if you can't reach the first, the first person on your list. In case of an Ebola PUI, internal first calls should be to infectious disease and infection control. These personnel will help guide you through the next steps in diagnosing and caring for your patient. Other important internal contacts include nursing and medical leadership of your ED, public safety, environmental services, laboratory, administration, and public relations. The questions listed on these slides are an important thought exercise to consider as you develop your communications plan, including what will change if the event occurs after hours, for example. In terms of external communication, you may need to communicate to EMS or transport, specialty services, and public health. It is important to consider who will make these phone calls. Often this may be the role of infectious disease or infection control at your facility. If you have an exercise, communication is an important aspect to trial, and it is great to invite your external participants to the table. The more you engage with them, the more they will understand your process and assist. By far, the best way to prepare for an event like this is to practice. I personally find mystery patient drills to be especially enlightening, and we always find many opportunities to improve our SOPs and communication through unannounced patient drills and REDs. NEETEC does have a toolkit on the website which can guide you through a drill for identify, isolate, and inform for your facility should you choose to use it. With that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Kate Bolter, to discuss PPE. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. That was really interesting. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, I'm Kate Bolter. I'm a nurse manager for the Nebraska Biocontainment Unit. And um, I'm really happy to be able to come here today and talk to you about PPE. So knowing that there's an outbreak and um, knowing what it is that we need to do, you know, th those are all very, very important, but also equally important is knowing, you know, what PPE we need to wear. And there's a lot of PPE out there that we can choose from. We, um, we wear PPE because it minimizes our risk uh, to infectious substances. Um, the, the PPE ensemble that we choose is really going to depend on the disease that we're um, protecting ourselves from. What is it about our bodies that we need to protect? And then on top of all of that, PPE must be used properly. So we've got to know how we're going to put it on correctly, how we're going to take it off in a way that we don't actually expose ourselves to the contaminants on the outside of that PPE. So if we were to look at our COVID PPE, um, we know that we get COVID because it's 
mainly transmitted person to person through respiratory droplets. So what we need to protect is our respiratory system. So we need to wear an N95 or higher respirator, um, to, you know, to, to protect our breathing. And uh, one of the things that, you know, we've really learned through COVID is that you can be an asymptomatic shedder of COVID. So wearing an N95 respirator that's properly fitted, we, we get double uh, protection because we're going to protect ourselves as we breathe in but also when we breathe out if we were an asymptomatic shedder we've got more chance that that's going to get contained in that mask however um, supplies uh, we've also learned this year that you know supplies can dwindle quite quickly and we, we need to do everything that we can to conserve those um, and so if you did end up not having any N95 respirators, the CDC did say that um, just a, a surgical or procedure mask is an acceptable alternative. And, you know, we have found that that does work. The other thing that we wear are face shields. And that's because, or, or goggles, and that's because, you know, we can also, you know, expose ourselves to COVID through our mucous membranes over our eyes. So we wear these face shields to protect our mucous membranes. We also wear a, an isolation gown. Now it's just a, a standard isolation gown. And this is really meant to protect our clothing so that we don't get the virus on our clothing. And then later when we're out of PPE, we would touch our clothing and then we could transfer that to our faces. And one pair of gloves, mainly you know, for the same reason, we don't wanna get the COVID on our hands. Um, and then introduce it to the areas where we can get sick. So that, that's COVID PPE. It does require training. You know, staff need to still know how they should put it on properly, how they take it off properly, where they should put it on and where they should be taking it off. So when it comes to Ebola um, PPE, it's, it's a, a lot different. A lot of the same concepts are, are still there, um, such as, you know, you must train your staff. You know, they absolutely must know how they put on this PPE and how they take it off safely. Remember, we'd be dealing with a disease that, um, you know, to catch it, you only have to become exposed to between one and 10 viruses. And so we want to make sure that, it, that, you know, they're not going to get exposed to that at all. So when you teach how to put on and take off their PPE, you also need to make sure that they're able to demonstrate that competency back to you. Um, and that's really important. And, you know, that will increase their confidence as well. If they know that you say, yes, you know, you, you are good at this and, and you did this correctly. When you're taking care of Ebola patients, you also must have a on-site manager at all times. Now, it doesn't have to be the same person. You know, I'm the nurse manager for Nebraska Medicines Biocontainment Unit. That doesn't mean I have to be there 24 hours a day, but I do have to have somebody there who can act um, in, in my stance if I, I'm you know, not there. So that on-site manager, they're going to be responsible for making sure of the, the smooth running of the, the unit during you know that shift they're going to try and anticipate um, what sort of cares may be needed and uh, make sure you've got all the supplies and that your staff have everything that they need you should also have an observer for donning and doffing and what that observer is going to do is they're going to watch and watch very closely everything that you know the person's putting on make sure they're following protocol and um, also making sure that you know during doffing that is coming off in the correct method and um, they're also following the, their protocol after the um, the doffing or the donning has been done um, it must be verified as being having done correctly with no deficiencies. So, you know, doing a safety check with the person who just got into their PPE or just got out of their PPE, making sure that every step of that process was followed. Um, and then, of course, you know, as you're training, um, you, you may come across some people who may be unwilling or unable to follow the procedures. They should not be permitted to care for Ebola patients. Um, the people that, that come to mind, uh, in my mind anyway, are, are people that, that may not be able to be uh, bend, be flexible enough um, to, to crouch down, um, th those sort of movements that are essential to staying safe as you're especially doffing your PPE. So um, Dr. Yaffe already, you know, went through, you know, how Ebola is transmitted, you know, through the body fluids. Um, 
just you know really remember that this is through it could be an alive person or a deceased person and uh, because it's you know the body fluids and it's contact disease um, we really need to keep our entire skin covered when we're taking care of um, these patients but how much PPE we need to put on really depends on the, the presentation of that that patient um, I'm, I'm sure all of you have heard you know wet and dry patients um, so a, a dry patient is someone who, you know, we would say is clinically stable. Uh, there's no vomiting, there's no bleeding, there's no diarrhea going on. And, and so your, your chance of, you know, becoming exposed to a body fluid at that time is very little. However, a wet patient, that would be someone who does have bleeding, has um, diarrhea or is vomiting. And so we we wear a lot more PPE in that situation. So you've got your dry and you've got your wet the real trick is knowing what if you have a dry patient and then they become wet? How do you know, making sure that during that transition time that um, you've got the right PPE on at that time. So the dry PPE, um, remember, no bleeding, no vomiting, no diarrhea. Um, and, and I would I, I would like go on, you know. Well, just a, a little precaution by saying if they feel like they've got nausea, then I would worry that they could have vomiting at any time. So I would go with the wet PPE. But if it doesn't look like that's going to happen, what you're going to need is a fluid resistant gown. And you want to make sure that that extends to mid calf, um, that it is single use and disposable. And um, you can also use a coverall if, if that's what you have on hand. And, and the CDC does recommend one without an integrated hood. Um, that would make it a lot more comfortable. Um, lets you also have access to your ears if you're going to be using a stethoscope, things like that. Um, you also need to have a full face shield um, and a face mask. It, it doesn't have to be an N95 for a dry patient. Um, just a, a regular procedure mask is fine. Um, we also need to have two pairs of gloves. Um, CDC says with extended cuffs, but if you can't have two pairs with extended cuffs, you can use a, a regular um, size pair of gloves um, followed with um, extended cuffs on the outside. Oh, and we've put all the links uh, to the CDC um, resources uh, at the bottom of these slides for you. So if you're going to be taking care of a, a wet patient, um, somebody who does have either bleeding, vomiting or diarrhea, or, you know, as I said, thinks that they may um, vomit any moment or, you know, has an upset stomach that you may, you know, suspect that. What you need is a fluid impermeable gown. And we're going to go through that in a little bit, you know, the difference between fluid resistant and fluid impermeable. But you want to make sure that that does extend uh, to mid-calf length. Um, what I want to point out, though, in this photograph, um, it shows that, you know, that it's pretty much an ankle length gown. And um, I, I would say, you know, you don't want to have your gown quite that long because that means, you know, if you're going to bend down, to, you know, to the floor to, to, you know, I don't know, empty a, a urinary catheter or something like that, then you know, your gown is going to be dragging on the floor. So you need to make sure that that's not going to happen as well. You do want it long enough, though, that um, with your, the top of your disposable boots is underneath uh, that gown. Uh, you also need to wear a full face shield or goggles. Um, I prefer the face shield rather than the goggles. Uh, goggles can be uncomfortable at times. And um, because they're uncomfortable, then that, that would lead me to want to, to move or adjust them. So, you know, face shield is probably better than goggles. Um, you can now wear an N95 respirator or a PAPR. Um, whatever you train for is, is what you should be wearing. Um, don't let the first time you put on your PAPR uh, be the time that you're going in to take care of a patient. Um, you also need to wear disposable boots and those, those disposable boots also need to be uh, fluid impermeable uh, just in case there's any spills on the floor or anything like that. And again, the same with the gloves, you need two pairs of gloves with extended cuffs. 
Um, the inner gloves, again, can be the regular cuff. The outer gloves really need, do need to be extended cuffs. And we say that because, you know, um, as many of you know, with these gowns, you know, you have your, your poly knit um, ribbed area on, on the cuffs. Well, that is not fluid impermeable. And so you want to make sure that your, guffs, uh, your gloves, your glove cuffs are long enough that can actually cover that. And, and come quite far up the arm so that you, you're completely making sure that you're not going to absorb any body fluids anywhere on that PPE. While you're taking care of your patient, um, you should disinfect your gloved hands with alcohol-based hand rub. And, um, you know, we did that successfully when we were taking care of Ebola patients. Um, if you do get any gross contamination on your gloves, then it is okay to, to wipe that gross contamination off first with like a disinfectant wipe and then go ahead and use your hand rub after that. So, you know, um, we wanted to like show you that there is a difference between impermeable and fluid resistant gowns. Now, the way I always think about it is, you know, if it's fluid resistant, if I was to create a little cup of that, that material and pour some fluid in there, then it won't go through immediately, but it will it'll resist it. But there will come a time when that will give and then the fluid will eventually soak through. Impermeable, however, that means it's impermeable, that, that fluid is not going to go through that. And the way that we can tell is when we look on our packages, we can see what the, the AMI levels are on our gowns. Um, AMI level three is fluid resistant. That, you know, we, we, is okay for a dry patient, but for a patient who has got confirmed Ebola, we need the level four which is impermeable because, you know, we will be dealing with body fluids at that time. So here are the standards that you need to look for on both gowns and coveralls. The, the standards, um, I, I wanted you to see this as well. So, so the AMI standards, the, the levels goes one through four. Four is what we want for um, a confirmed Ebola patient, remember. Um, and you can see when they, they get tested what it is that they're using so you know if you're using a gown that is a stand amy level one then that's only being challenged with water um, and that's the same all the way up to a level three level four however they are using a synthetic blood um, and also a bacteriophage to make sure that that doesn't go through still has its limitations you know because you know there's you know um, the pressure that, you know, the, whatever that fluid is um, uh, coming at that PPE at, or that gown net, um, that that can take effect, you know, if it's more than um, the 13.8 that they have here, then there, there is a, a good chance that it may penetrate, okay, or 2 PSI is what it says. And, and here's your labels. Um, uh, we just want to emphasize level four for wet patient. So you can see here, um, level four gown um, is what you're going to be looking for. So we created um, a, a little grid um, that you can look at to compare. So if you're you know, taking care of COVID patients, you can see what your preferred PPE is, what an alternative is. And that, the, the alternative, the only difference is between the N95 and um, the face mask. Um, after that, we've got your Ebola clinically stable, you know, the items that you can wear, and that could be either the gown or a coverall. Um, then we've got the Ebola clinically unstable. And there's four different ensembles that you can choose from. You can have your N95 respirator with a gown or respirator with a coverall, um, or you can have the PAPR with a gown or a coverall. Remember, it must be trained on. You know, staff must be able to show competency in, in their ability to put it on properly and take it off properly. Um, we'd also like to just mention that, you know, you can wear a disposable apron over your gown as well. And um, that, that helps to keep your PPE clean or less contaminated to make it a little bit safer for you for when you um, are getting out of it. 
So I am now going to hand it back to Trish Tennell, who will handle our question and answer section. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Ribner, Dr. Yaffe, and Kate. I thought that was really amazing. And no matter how many times I do this and how many times I read different things, I always learn from our presenters in these webinar series. So um, Kate, I just want to direct you towards the Q&A. Uh -huh. um, we have a question about, um, here it is, and I think this is pretty pertinent, is how often and how long can gloves be cleaned with an alcohol-based cleaner before degradation? Hmm. So I, I don't know that, um, that there's been any studies. I, I know there were some in um, production that were looking at you know hand sanitizer on gloves. Um, but I, I'm sorry, I, I haven't looked to see if um, there's any limitations on how long. I will say though, um, vinyl gloves, they cannot be um, used hand, hand rub on because the, the hand sanitizer will degradate them. Um, when we were take it, yeah, when we were taking care of our Ebola patients, I mean, we were, we were using bleach wipes and we were using, um, hand sanitizer on them a lot and we never had any problems. So I, I would have a lot of confidence that you're going to get through your shift or, or your, your four hour period taking care of the patient, um, without any problems. Thank you so much, Kate. I know this is kind of a hot topic right now, but mm -hmm. if you have, you guys have any other questions about that, you can always send it to us at needtech.org. So I'm going to ask Dr. Ribner this. Um, we got a question for what from one of our registrants, and it's recommendations on convincing leadership to pervert to pursue Ebola initiatives while we are recovering in many ways from COVID. And I think we're all struggling with that right now. Uh, I would have to say that's an issue that preceded COVID by five years. Uh, how, do, how does one get uh, leadership to participate in uh, supporting biopreparedness? And the bottom line is what you have to say is, we know these patients may come to our facility. Your question is, do you want to be prepared or do you want to be unprepared like certain facilities which made the headlines in 2014? And uh, I, I know having spoken to many executive uh, leadership, hospital leadership from many facilities, uh, when, when you put it in that light, uh, they, they realize which, uh, which approach they want to use. Thank you, Dr. Ribner. Uh, we have a couple minutes. I can get one more question in there and I'm going to send this to Dr. Yaffe. What are the difference in roles for infection prevention and emergency management? Thanks, Trish. I think that it really depends on the capabilities at your facility, but in general, infection prevention and control and potentially infectious disease will be helping you with the um, isolation, the identify, isolate, and inform aspect of your patient care. So giving you um, isolation guidance and facilitating that care in your facility. Whereas emergency management will really be looking at the bigger picture, facilitating the waste and the transport and the communications aspects of that patient care. Thank you so much, Dr. Yaffe. Remember, NeTech's here to help. Any questions you guys have, you want your protocols reviewed, you want to you know, help help doing a protocol, finding out where to get these drills, please contact us at info at needtech.org and needtech.org. We are here for you and will continue to be here for you. Join us in our conversation. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we have a blog, we're on Instagram, and we are on LinkedIn. We have courses that are available for CEUs and CMEs at needtech.org. We're also on YouTube where you're able to see some of our skills video. I know earlier I saw a question that was answered by Dr. Yaffe about transporting a patient. And we do have a video on our containment wrap slash burrito wrap available for you to view. We also have our repository, which is just full of many things. Why reinvent the wheel when we have it here for you? I would like to thank everybody who attended there. Please be safe. Please continue to hand hygiene and wear the appropriate PPE for your appropriate task or mode of transmission. Thank you again, and come see us at newtech.org. Have a good day.